Hey everybody, it's good to be back in church together and we believe in God for, for miracles and signs and wonders as we transition back to normality. We're going to be speaking to you today about freedom from racism. It's a massive subject and we're not going to be able to do it justice in 25 minutes and we're going to leave some things unsaid. We ask you to understand, uh, but we believe it's important enough for us to continue to nudging away, chipping, chipping away at the issues that plagues our nation and our church. And so let's trust God together for a deeper work of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your ministry and your person. We thank you that you are there to help us change and grow. And to whatever extent we need healing, we pray that through this message, that we'll be healed, set free, and that your name will be glorified in and through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Whether racialism, tribalism, sexism, stereotyping, or any form of prejudice and discrimination, it has its origin in the same sinful nature of humans. It is a condition that we all have to face. No matter who you are, the notion that someone you are better than someone else is based on an unsafe, unsanctified heart and has no place in the church and no place in a Christian's life. Racism and sexism is to deny the very image of God, God himself, in another ethnic group or gender. In Genesis chapter 1, 27, God said, so God created man in whose image? His image. Mm -hmm. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Racism is saying that I'm better. My culture is right. My skin, my hair type is more beautiful. Mm -hmm. My ethnic group is more intelligent. On the surface, we have the sense to know that this is wrong. We know that this can't be right. But when I see some of the actions and reactions to current events, I have to ask if the sanctifying work of the cross has gone deep enough. Mm. Before we declare ourselves free from racism or prejudice, let us listen to the Holy Spirit as we go through the Word of God together today. And let us listen to each other in a small group context as we engage on the subject and we hear each other's stories. We might discover that there are some room for healing and some room for change in our lives. When we joke with statements like black people's hair is not normal, we reinforce stereotypes that is very hurtful. Mm. It really is. And I've heard the jokes. I've heard... I've seen the, the WhatsApp uh, that's been sent to different groups and it's hurtful because there's a context to the hair issue. For those of you who still don't know, and you should know, and the fact that you don't know tells me that you're, not, you're somewhat indifferent to find out what hurt our nation and people in the nation in order to respond the way you should respond. So it's incumbent on you to know the history. Just by the way. But in South Africa, we had an idiotic law in all the parts of South Africa by which black and colored people could be reclassified, other words, upgraded as whites. If your skin complexion was light enough and you passed the pencil test, the pencil test relates directly to the hair. They would take a pencil if you would apply it to become white which I didn't understand why some did, but anyway. If you would apply to come white, become white, they would take a pencil, they would stick it into your hair as a black or colored person, and if the pencil remained in your hair, if you bent down, you didn't qualify. You didn't make the cut. But if it fell out, you perhaps could make the cut, providing that you have some financial means, or you have the right class system, or you have some achievement that could bring benefit to white people. You could be upgraded to white status. Now, of course, we laugh at that today and we think, oh, so how stupid is that? But yet people believed it. People practiced it. 
and we affirmed it in our nation, mm -hmm. in our laws. So when we talk about black people's hair, there's more to this issue on just hair products. There's a deep-seated root connected to their identity and their makeup as God made them to be. And that's what you're joking about. That's what, that's what you classify as abnormal. And so let's be careful. Let's listen. Before we, before we judge, let's just find out why is the anger there? Why is the response there? We see racism in the early church. 25 years roughly after Christ's death, at the very inception of the church, we see racism really is hidden in the church. The moment Jewish Christians was now exposed to other cultures and Gentile Christians, racism picked up this head. So we see that in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. It says, When Cephas, who was Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him, Paul says, to his face, because he stood condemned. He used strong words. For before certain men came from James, James was in Jerusalem, he was the pastor in that congregation, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separated himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas, who was Paul's close partner in ministry, was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, this is a gospel matter, I said to Cephas, Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Now the context, briefly, of this particular context uh, is, 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 is found back even before what happened in Antioch. In, in, in Acts chapter 15, we read about Jerusalem Council, where the early church fathers gathered together. Paul traveled to Jerusalem to be part of this council because, because it was in, in, important enough for us to, for him to settle the issue where the Gentiles had to be circumcised to become part of the church. And finally, after much debate, James stood up, the pastor of the church, and he said, No. If the Holy Spirit recognized them by baptizing them in, 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 in the Holy Spirit and God receives them as in his fold, who are we to put our, our, our customs upon them as, mm. as, 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 as conditions to become Christians? We too are, ought to receive them in the church if God receives them as his children. That settled the matter, seemingly. Now we find... Not late, long after that incident, Peter now is in Antioch with Paul, coming to visit the Gentiles in the church in Antioch, which was a phenomenal church. It was a cosmopolitan church. There were not just Greeks there, there was Romans. There was all sorts of people. People from Africa was there. There was a diverse church in Antioch. And Peter's having a party with everybody. There's no issue with mixing with them, receiving the culture, and worshipping with them. But when... James' delegation came, when the Judaizers came, when the Christian Jews came, he withdrew. And people, Paul addressed this issue as hypocrisy. Because what they were preaching, in spite of what the Jewish council said, that unless you follow our customs, un unless you, you, you laugh at our jokes, unless you, you agree with our, 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 our customary religious practices, you're not one of us. You're not one of the, the fall, the family of God. I see that today in the church somewhat as well, that some people put their own customs on others. I'm not talking about biblical values. I'm talking about their own customs. And unless people worship the way we do, unless people agree with us in everything, unless people practice our customs, we don't fully receive them as our brothers and sisters. That's discrimination. And Paul addresses the issue head on. He says, this is nonsense, guys. Peter, you should know better. Not only have you had your, your private experience with, with your dream of the Holy Spirit telling you to eat what is unclean. In other words, mix with unbelievers, mix with, with Gentiles, mix with other cultures. 
that God has called all things clean. And everything that, that was this customary laws was fulfilled in the cross, including circumcision. You now, you now reverting back. And Paul says, no, this is hypocrisy. He does a public rebuke of another leader, another apostle. So, what I want to say, Paul confronted Peter's racism head on. It is important to note that it is Paul who confronted his fellow Jew, not the Gentiles in Antioch. Paul was a Jew of the Jews, he called himself, a lawyer, lawyer of the lawyers. Paul had any right, every right to become, uh, you, you know, status uh, holy about his Jewish, uh, Jewishness. But here's what Paul does. He stands up for the Gentiles. He stands up for those who discriminate. As a Jew, he stands up for those who have been discriminated against. If you have benefited from the system at the expense of others, you need to break the system that you benefited from, particularly if it's ungodly, like, like racism, like white privilege, whatever that means in our context. And yes, there is still a white privilege. Make no mistake. And if you really want to know, we can talk about that. We welcome further conversation in our small groups in particular. But our churches will never look different if we don't allow our homes to, to if we allow our homes to remain unchanged. Albert Tate says. He wrote the book Multicultural Church Starting in the Living Room. And I want you to know if you are overprotective of your child, not allowing them to mix. And be in, in convenience with other people's cultures? If that's an inconvenience, I, I beg to differ. But if you see it that way, if you, don't, if you don't mix yourself with other cultures and you really build deep tissue friendship, as we talk about later, you will never really be free from prejudice and racism. What should the church look like then? What is the hope we have for ourselves as a church and for the world ultimately? And we see an example of that church in God's very house. Revelation 7, verse 9, tells us what the church looked like. It says, After this, this I look and behold, can you look and see heaven right now? A great multitude no one could number. A lot of people are going to make it to heaven, praise God. From every nation, from all tribes, and peoples and languages standing before the throne. No one's left out. Everybody's there. And before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, we all made righteous. With palm branches in our hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. That's the picture. That's the church. Mm. That's the church we ought to have right here. Worshipping together, not apart. Building a unified church, a multi-ethnic church, is a picture of God's people at the climax of history. It depicts that multi-ethnic congregation for every tribe, every language, every people, every nation, all gathered together to worship before God's throne. People sometimes come to me advocating a mono-ethnic environment. Uh, and sometimes for uh, outreach or soul-winning uh, soul purposes. I don't understand it, but some say a predominant culture in a congregation, you know, that's, that's, that's okay. And uh, it's sadly sometimes unavoidable because of group area acts. You know, it's concentrated of certain races or certain ethnic groups in certain contexts because of apartheid. And that in itself is wrong and should be fought against. But it is a reality. And my answer is, is normally, it really depends if you want to be part of a church that reflects the vision of a broken society. That's just more of this. It's not different from the world. Or do you want to be the answer and be the church that reflects the unity of heaven? That picture of Revelation 7. Which church do you want to be part of? A predominant culture or a monoculture church? Or a multicultural church? that reflects the deep work of the cross, even to the place of dealing with our prejudice mm. and our racism. And we all can have them, black or white. 
we might dress differently or like different music and different food. We might look differently and speak different languages. This was never meant to divide us, but to complete us. Our culture is the spice of humanity. It is not humanity itself. It is not the essence of who we are. It's the flavor we bring to humanity. We need a bit of Kosa flavor. We really need a lot of Zulu flavor. We love Zulus. We need Venden flavors. We need Indebelli flavors. We need German flavors. We need colored Khoisan flavors. <coughs> we need Indian flavors. We need Afrikaner flavors. We need Sutus. We need Congolese. We need, we need Zimbabwean flavors. We need Angolan flavors. We need every flavor from every culture to, to make this dish, this human dish, this humanity taste the way it should be. You know, the Bible describes unity as, as, as a sweet fragrance before God. That's how God intended for us to be. To be together, not apart. Apartheid is from the pit of hell. It was designed to break human part, to, 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 to hinder worship in heaven, ultimately. For God needs to hear the songs from every nation, every tribe. So, in essence, we are really the same. It might be different flavors, but we're actually the same. We all need to take care, want to take care of our kids. Mm -hmm. We all want our kids to succeed. We all want our families to be secure. We all want to be safe and loved and accepted in the community. We all have the same mm -hmm. needs to be free from sin and its consequences and the need to be reunited with our Creator. It's, that's the essence of humanity. We are all equal according to Galatians chapter 3 verse 28. It says there is no Jew, Greek, slave, free, male, female, or all. We are all one in Christ. That's the word of God. The slightest notion of ethnic class or gender superiority is denying of the reality of justification itself. It's a gospel issue. Not only are we called to be equal, but we're called to be united. Paul emphasizes it's not just equality that's important, but it's unity. Many are happy to be equal, but not united. Happy to be equal somewhere else, but not together. You happen to, to consent that everybody's created equal, but as long as it doesn't mean that I have to be united with you and be inconvenienced in my context because I like me and people who look like me and people who are homogeneous like me. Oh, God has called us to step out from other out of our culture and be flavored by other people in, in our spicing. If you only have got a mono spice, you've got a very bland dish. It's time to get spiced up. Ephesians, Paul stresses uh, that in Christ groups that were formerly hostile, like Jews and Gentiles, are now brought together in unity in the body of Christ. Many years ago, the Lord gave me a choice to be upgraded in the struggle for freedom in my life. Uh, I was challenged to have the spiritual discernment as a Christian. To rise above the emotional trauma of the crisis that I was facing, and many of us were facing in the nation, and to focus on what should we should and could have, and not what we didn't have. The Lord said to me, son, you can spend too much time and energy fighting against white domination, which is a legitimate fight at the time, or black domination. And our president Mandela really ta taught us he's fought against both. And I have too little energy to fight for kingdom unity. And there's a subtle difference between fighting against something and fighting for something. We can be so busy fighting against another ethnic group or gender, we can, and we can miss out and never have what we meant to have together. But this is my story really is very really speaks to this because uh, at the time I really didn't understand what the Lord was doing with me. I was very involved in the struggle. Well, not very involved, but I was somewhat involved. And I was activated because of pain that, that I personally experienced. This wasn't just a national issue for me. It was a very personal issue for me. 
which makes it harder to change from. So when I came into his people, every nation, his people those years was one of the few churches with the multicultural. It wasn't popular like it is now. Well, it's going back to where it was then now. But but certainly was it was the first time I really was engaging with white people as a colored man. Even though I've seen them, I've never interacted with white people. Neither, didn't, didn't want to. Didn't need to. I was too angry and fighting against them. But but I came into his people every nation those years and and uh, we we uh, I was involved on a campus at DWC as a as a campus minister, and and we had to print uh, for once about one of our meetings uh, some pamphlets. And so the only person that was working for the church at that time was my wife Vanessa. Uh, and we and the church was very small at the time, and the office was at Paul Daniel's house. Uh, Pastors make all these sacrifices. And so Vanessa was in the office as we came into the office with my friend Jean, the Dean Carlson, uh, to, to do this printing. As I walked into, into the home, I saw this white blonde lady checking me out. And the first thought, I must be honest with you, that came to my mind, typical. She's checking out for what I'm going to steal. That's the first thought. That came in mind. But baby, tell the people, why are you really checking me out? <laughs> he really loves the story. <laughs> <laughs> so I had seen Gillian, um, I don't know, I can't remember the time frame, but a couple of months before that at a youth rally at a different church. Um, I'd seen him across the hall, like in the distance. I'm like, wow, that's a really cute guy. And I was so shocked by that because mm -hmm. here I am, this, this is in the 80s. Uh, I'm a white girl and he's a colored guy. I thought, am I even allowed to think that and feel that? And I was quite shocked by that. Um, but then, and I didn't meet him that day, but then this is months later, he comes walking into the office. And my thought was, gosh, he has this guy that I saw that was so cute. And, and I'm, I'm checking him out because I thought, he's really cute. So I'm watching him and checking him out. And of course, Gillian's just thinking the complete wrong message by me checking it. He's assuming by history that I'm checking to see what is he doing, is he touching, is he stealing and that was the last thing on my mind but I was checking him out because he was so cute. So I was busy fight, so busy fighting against something and not fighting for something that I could have missed, the very gift of God for me, not just a spice, <laughs> not just some white spice but she is my, my, my life mate and I wonder how many Miss, miss out on God's blessings because we're fighting against, not fighting for. Uh, that we're spending our energies really trying to highlight what, what is different and not what is similar, what we have in common. And I believe that we ought to have celebrate different cultures. And as far as lining up with the kingdom values and the word of God. But we must never, never Forget that we are born into a new family with its own culture that that becomes the superior, the predominant culture, the kingdom culture. Mm. Jesus prays for us to be one, extends across the ethnic and gender lines. It's not just between people in your congregation, your community. It really goes beyond the class lines. Some struggle to understand why in South Africa we're still struggling with issues of race. And some are frustrated, some are angry, some are hurting, some are indifferent. And it seems like we're not winning on the battle of racism or, or dealing with racism. And I want us to talk a little bit about the long-term impact of racial trauma and why we're still struggling. Why is it? And how do we get free from the fix and the pain of racism, the practicing and the pain that it produces of racism. Darling, my wife is a phenomenal trained counselor. She's uh, really equipped herself over the years to help people to be, be free from all sorts of addictions and pain and trauma. So we're going to be talking about how we can access freedom. How do we, what do we do with this, these experiences that we've felt? And it's different for each and every person, but we all have triggers. We all have experiences um, different for each, each different person has their own stories and their triggers. So 
we find that something can happen, something can be said. Uh, sometimes it's just in non-verbal language that can trigger somebody or you can have a reaction to it. All those hurts that come up that we don't always understand why, where it comes from, or why is this still such an issue? Why aren't we further along the pathway? Mm. Why aren't we more healed and healthy? Yeah. So um, I just want to touch on just such a little, as, little bit of it. Obviously, it's very complex. It's very layers. But let's look at how we are wired, how we are made up. Mm. Um, how does trauma, because I think racism is a trauma that people have been through. It's, it's, it's so deep rooted. It's so deep inside of us, the pain. The hurt is generations yeah. of of prejudice yeah. and racism towards people. So science has come a long way in understanding the makeup of our brain and how we are wired, and how we ch how we can even change. You know, before we used to always think, you know, the first five years everything's formed in our brain and that's you know. But now we know that we can actually change our wiring in our brain. We can rethink. We can change the way. We live our lives. Our experiences throughout life change and mold us. And this is called um, neural plasticity. We're looking at how our neurons in our brain work and how that impacts how we react, how we respond, how what our reactions to things are. So we've learned through science um, and they've now proven that our brain is shaped, molded and changed by experiences that we go through. And by generational experience, not just yours and my experience, what my fathers and, and predecessors have been through, what your predecessors have been through, greatly affects how we look at life today. Our habits, our, um, our experiences all change and impact that. So the way you think, the way you feel, the way you act is, is who you, what you're made up of. And those are neural pathways. When we talk about a neural pathway, those neural pathways are formed by the same thinking again and again and again. And when you keep having those same neural tracts, those same thoughts, it creates a neural pathway that becomes automatic. A physical neural pathway. A, neur a physical in our brain, a physical neural pathway that will think, I am responding to something racist now, or I am behaving in a racist way. You might not think that you're doing it, you might not understand that you're doing it, but it's an automatic response that we need to realize Mm -hmm. I need to retrain the way I'm thinking. I need yeah. to retrain the way I'm responding. I need to retrain my brain and we can do it. The interesting thing is that the area in our brain that creates these new neurons, these new pathways, is also the same place that holds our memories. Mm -hmm. So we can see the power of a memory, mm -hmm. but we can rewire that. So we don't have to live with negative memories. We don't need to live with negative trauma. Sometimes you think, okay, I've been through this and yes, you've been through it. Yes, it was terrible, mm. but we can rewire ourselves. I mean, that's the good news. Yes. This is also why discipleship is so important. Being in the Word of God is so important because that is retraining the way we think. Mm -hmm. When we go to the Word of God and we see what God says about us, being equal, being the same, living in unity, the way mm. we should treat each other, that we don't treat somebody better than the other. When we focus on that, when we train ourselves in that, it's rewiring our brain. It's literally re renewing your literally mind. Literally yeah. renewing your mind. Physically, literally yeah. renewing your mind. It's not oh. just a, a nice thought. Yeah. So the scripture really can change who we are and, and rewire us um, to freedom. And it's the word of God and the power of God and the Holy Spirit that brings that freedom as we re as we focus and go through what the word of God says. But it takes a while. Mm. It's it's something, and that's why some people say, why isn't it happening quicker? I'm not saying generations. Mm. But it takes deliberate and focused intent on rewiring um, through our life experience. So your behavior, my behavior, yours, listening to me. Our behavior affects our children, our great our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, just like our predecessors have. Their behaviors, their experiences, their traumas have affected us today. Mm -hmm. The Bible speaks about those blessings and curses that go multi-generational. It gets passed down. And we have experienced that, in, especially in the area of prejudice and racism, mm -hmm. where it's been generations of prejudice, of racism, of breaking people down, mm -hmm. or generations of superiority, yeah. um, of indifference, um, inequality. That's been a generational thing that's been passed down. Um, I've had this conversation recently. Like when I was a child, I I should have someone saying, "Why didn't we know that racism was wrong?" 
because I was taught that it wasn't wrong. Mm. I was taught that it was right through experience, through verbal, through generational. I was taught that this is the way we live, that white people are better. Mm -hmm. I didn't have, until I encountered the word of God, that this is wrong. This is not the way we should live. It's something that was passed down generationally. So it's a deep rooted sin pattern. Yeah. Deep, you know, we all know somebody, or maybe you're even yourselves, where you've got sin patterns in your life that you try so hard to break from. When it's a generational sin pattern, it's, it takes deliberate work sure. of having to, how do I change the way I think? How do I change the way I work? Because this is generational. Mm. So I need to be able to reactivate my conscience, my neural pathways. I need to start thinking differently, focusing differently, and mm -hmm. um, really studying what God says about who we are and what he wants us to do. A seared conscience, and a lot of people have this without realizing, is when you don't actually have any sorrow or ability to experience pain over your sin, and you don't think, wow, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. I actually feel deep pain, the fact that I can treat you differently because of my skin color or mm -hmm. hair or humor or food that i think i'm better if, if i don't feel pain over that and see the sin of it my conscience has been seared in it because it's been taught to me yeah. so then we need to go to the word of god say god help me to heal help me to see right help me to understand help me to have compassion and allow god to rewire us so so you're saying you know both from the oppressor and, the, and those oppressed that We've been affected by the constant reinforcing of a message yes. of superiority and inferiority. Yes. Yes. And we, 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 we intuitively now believe and live that out. That's right. We, we've that. learned it as truth. Yes. And even though we know it's no longer truth, we, we in a new South Africa, we're free. We, we know differently. Why are we still experiencing some of this pain? Mm -hmm. Because it's been generational. Mm -hmm. Some of the generational trauma and, and this blows my mind when I think of the impact of it. And scientists have, have now proven this, that you get generational trauma, something that could have happened to your grandmother that triggered something so traumatic, it comes into your DNA and it gets passed down. So for example, what, what is that called, it's, it's generational trauma, okay. neuro, neurological trauma in okay. your DNA. So these traumas get passed on through your DNA. Okay. So if your predecessors have experienced racism, or superiority they pass in that on through your dna i get born thinking that i'm superior you get born thinking that you're inferior and then it gets reinforced by what you experience okay. for example my grandmother for example could it have could have been attacked by a dog and had a really traumatic experience and from that every time she sees a dog she that that trauma gets triggered this the chemical release in your body is the same trauma so she gets a chemical release because of the trauma and that fear and that flight happens that can get passed generationally i can two generations later i've never experienced something with a dog a dog can come along because of the dna because of the trauma the same chemical release gets released in my body because of that trauma and i think oh, why am i so fearful why am i getting this reaction to this dog coming towards me um so, or it might, it, any sort of trauma, a car accident mm -hmm. can trigger a chemical release because it's a trauma that's been passed generationally. And I believe that's, a, that's what's happened with racism. Mm -hmm. When you experience some form of racism or you're projecting some sort of racism, there's, there's something that happens in our psyche that responds. So there's also some of the generational impact is word curses. Uh, where we have spoken or received word curses. The poverty, poverty mentality is mm. huge. The orphan spirit. Um, I think of a lot of pre, pre, um, our predecessors in the black communities where the fathers were sent off to the mines, were sent off to go and work. Yeah. Even the mothers were sent off to go and work. Mm. Children are passed on to granny. They've got an orphan spirit. Where do I belong? Where's my family? Um, Negative talk, inner vows, um, oppressors, those that were um, instituting apartheid and oppressing, that becomes a generational thing that we have to break. The rejection that came in apartheid mm. is such a huge thing. When you, when you experience rejection in your soul, to get healing from that, God can do it in the instant, but we need to recognize where this is coming from. 
So some of the examples that I've thought of is, is word curses or generational curses. For example, someone saying to you, black people are not safe. I got taught that growing up. You might have been taught white people cannot be trusted. Your father told you. My that, mother would have taught me. But your father told you, don't marry a colored man because they beat their wives, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what he said to me. I knew, I know a woman who married a colored man and she, he used to beat her up. I'm like, I know of a white person who married a white <laughs> man and he beat her up. It's not a racial issue. It's a yeah. sin issue. Yeah. Um, I was taught that men are inferior. Yeah. So there's the sexism. It yeah. was taught to me. Men are inferior. They are not to be trusted. What about when someone speaks to you in those words, you will never amount to something. You will never have what that person has. Mm. Those are all confessions and curses that were spoken over us. So what do we do with this? First of all, we have to be in the Word of God. We have to physically, literally renew our mind with the Word of God. Mm. But we have to confess our sins. Where there has been either prejudice and racism, um, experienced or felt we have to confess that we have to renounce it mm -hmm. and then we have to repent repent of our every one of us have prejudices let's repent of those things yeah. let's ask God to forgive us for the wrong that we've done and forgive those that have wronged us the most powerful and the most important part of getting freedom is repentance and forgiveness when we repent and when we offer and receive forgiveness it allows the holy spirit to step in and say i'm going to set you free today but repentance does not mean that we that we don't recognize systemic racism that still exists today sure you know, it might still happen and it yeah. might still happen again and yes. you might still experience it but when you forgive yes. you say i'm not letting that have a hold over me yeah. i'm not letting that thing rob me anymore i'm not allowing that curse that generational words to have that hold any, anymore because i know who i am I know what the Word of God says about me. I know my identity. Mm -hmm. So when your behavior tells me I'm less than or more than or different to, I say, I'm not going to receive that. I'm not going to accept that because I know the Word of God and mm -hmm. I know who my Father is and what He says about me. Yeah. So I bless you. Mm -hmm. I release you. I'm not going to let that have a hold over me because I know who I am. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna, we're going to confess and renounce. We're going to repent and forgive. And then we bless that person. You know what? So you've hurt me, or maybe I've hurt you. Mm. You say, I forgive. I bless you, baby. I bless you. I bless mm. you to, because I know who God says I am. And, and I know who God says you are as well. Mm. Mm. And you're also made in his image. Mm. So that is how we accept and receive the forgiveness of God. Mm. Would you lead us into that? So let us pray together, each and every one of us. And, and this affects every single one of us. Mm. Father God, right now we just bring our hearts before you. And, and I trust that you've spoken to each and every person about those areas in each of our lives that you're putting your finger on, where we have received hurt, where we have given hurt. Yes. I just pray right now, first of all, I renounce anything that I have done to have hurt my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. I confess that I have maybe done things that have been ungodly and sinful. And Father God, forgive me of those things, Father mm -hmm. God. I pray right now that you'd illuminate it and show me and each and every person where we have wronged. Yes, I Lord. confess it as sin before you. I also just want to repent, Father God, of any areas of sin in my life. And I renounce those where I have perpetuated that. Yes, I Lord. want to speak forgiveness over those who have hurt me. Mm -hmm. Those that have hurt each person listening right now. We speak forgiveness mm -hmm. and we release and renounce every bit of hurt that has come against us. Father God, yes, bring that forgiveness. Bring that yes. healing balm of your Holy Spirit just to wash over us. And let all those curses, that rejection, that racism, let it fall off of us right now. As your mm. Holy Spirit comes to bring forgiveness, renewing, renewing our mind. Mm. And right now I bless every person that has hurt me. Mm. I bless every person that I've hurt. I pray the blessings of Abraham over them. Your, your godly blessings of a future, of prosperity, of health, of identity, of fullness, Father. God, I thank you that we can look to the cross mm -hmm. and re receive forgiveness and receive wholeness because of the work of the cross. Yes, so we receive that now and we choose to walk in it, God. May each and every one of us know the word of God, know what you say yes, about us. Lord. Walk in that every single day, Father God. We'll confess and walk in the truth of yes, who Lord. you have made us to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We know we've just touched the surface of a very deep,
an important subject. And we invite you to continue having the conversation. Yeah, if you're struggling it. with any of what we say, please ask for help. Uh, if there's things that God is highlighting, get with someone, let them pray with you. Be in the disciple relationship, be in a small group. Make sure that you're not walking alone. You can't deal with these things by yourself. These are involving people. And particularly, let's 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 get some more spices in our lives. Let's cross the barriers. And let's get spiced up. God bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye.